morning, everybody, and I'm very excited to tell you all about the School of St Jude, which was established back in 2002. So the School of St Jude in the, is in East Africa, in the country of Tanzania. The schools actually are about 10 hours' drive from the coast of Tanzania, and if you're good swimmers, then you can go across to Zanzibar. So that's where we are. Uh, of course, a lot of people come to our area to see all the wildlife. We've got the Serengeti and a lot of national parks. And those people with a bit of energy like to climb the highest mountain in Africa as well, Mount Kilimanjaro. And in actual fact, our secondary school is only about 20 minutes drive from the Mount Kilimanjaro airport. However, behind the nice roads to the airport and the big hotels in town is the reality. People in our area are also very poor and so that's why you'll also find the three schools of St Jude also in that area. So a lot of people have asked me, how did I get there and how did all this start? Uh, well, I'm from northern New South Wales, um, off a sheep property, and uh, I was brought up with seven brothers. I think that taught me a lot of survival skills pretty much from birth. <laughs> Sadly, we lost Dad about ten years ago, but Mum's still on the property. Now, after university, I worked as a volunteer teacher for a few years in East Africa in a girls' private school. I loved it. But it was a girls' private school, and like most private schools around the world, the girls' parents had to have a fair bit of money to send their daughters there. And I was young at the time, and I thought, you know, why are all private schools so expensive? Why do they always charge high school fees? You know, I want to build a private school that's free of charge for the poor. You know, now if I'd actually, you know, done a business plan, opened an Excel spreadsheet, I would have realised why they charge high school fees. But at the time, I just wanted to start this free private school. So I came back to Australia all really excited about wanting to build this school and I was having lunch with a great friend of mine and I was telling her, you know, Haggie, I really want to build this school in Tanzania. You know, a good private free school for the poor. And uh, being a good friend that she is, she gave me $10 and I excitedly went to the bank and opened a bank account and that started the construction account on which the school was built. And my father then introduced me to rotary clubs and schools in our area and a number of parishes and family and friends got behind us. So we were able to raise about $20,000 to start the construction of the school. We started off with two acres of land and this is a picture of the original two acres of land. And then a group of friends from my hometown took the $20,000 that we had all raised together across to Tanzania to start the construction of the school. You know, there was a few Rotarians, um, a few teachers who were friends of mine, they brought their children, a few students from the University of New, South, you know, um, New England, and, um, you know, my friend Tyson with the red hat, and he was sort of just finished his building apprenticeship. So even though there wasn't a lot of skills in the team, they had lots of heart and lots of passion, and I've learned over the years that that's what's kept the school going and growing, is all the passion and heart of the people uh, involved with the project. Finally, by 2002, the school was ready for opening and we had a huge enrolment in the school. We had three students. So the picture on the right is a picture of the total enrolment of the school when we started in 2002. Now, every year since then, we've worked really hard and uh, normally we come out to Australia once a month, I mean once a year, to come out to do fundraising, rotary groups, schools, families, individuals, companies, all do what they can um, to raise money for the school. That money is tax deductible and we get all the money over in Tanzania and with that money we build more classrooms, more dormitories, buy more land, more buses, build more play equipment so that we can employ more cooks, drivers, cleaners, gardeners, boarding staff so that 150 extra students can start wearing the School St Jude uniform. So 150 students go into the school every single January in kinder and grade one. So what do the schools look like now? Well, we're actually made up of three schools. We've got two primary schools and a secondary school with about 1,800 students currently and uh, 1,200 of them are in boarding. We've got about 450 Tanzanian staff with about 37 Western staff also at the school. Now, when I started the school, you know, <clears throat> it was very hard, but we made the decision to have Tanzanian teachers as opposed to the old ideas of, you know, having Western staff who are much better educated and, and um, enlightened and, you know, come from good uh, educated backgrounds. But uh, sadly, for about six years, we actually couldn't run the school with a Tanzanian headmaster or headmistress because we didn't have anyone who was capable enough for that job. However, after six years, we got our first headmaster who had originally started out at the school as a science teacher. And now I'm very proud to say that all our three schools are led by total Tanzanian leadership teams. Each are made up with staff members who had originated at the school as a teacher. 
And it's wonderful that we've got men and women. Normally, women are not seen in leadership positions, but we've challenged that as well. We've got women in leadership, and we've got people from different tribes and different religions, and that's really good for the kids to know that it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are, we are a boy, girl, tribe, you know, Christian or not Christian, you can work and uh, have a bit of passion, you'll be promoted. So these leadership teams oversee everything on their own campuses, from all the food, the teaching, the academics, the gardening. They work with our teacher mentors who come from time to time to help bring up the teaching techniques of our staff. And then they also work very hard with our parent committee. Normally people who come from the poor areas are not given much of a, a voice, but we have given a voice to our parents uh, from day one, and it's actually a very strong voice that they have. We have a 50-strong parent committee who work with our staff and our leaders at each schools, and they help to manage all of our 1,800 parents and all their families. And the current uh, boss of that parent committee is also a woman. So it's good for the community to see that women can have good leadership roles and do a good job in those roles in our area. The other half of our school is called the business section, and it's the business section that enables the school to be free of charge. It's the business section who raises all the money to pay for all the running costs and capital. It's the business section who liaises with our 2,000 plus visitors that we get every year. We do have visitors at the school. We actually have a little motel thing happening where we've got about 30 rooms at the school where you can come and stay. You get your own room, uh, bed, mozzy net, and toilet and shower. You just don't walk out into a nice foyer with soft music and a water fountain. You just walk out onto the playground. But it's the visitor section um, that deals with that under the business section's name. It's the business section that helps to select those 150 students who get a scholarship every January. And it's the business section who oversees all the IT, uh, all the bus maintenance. We have 23 school buses, all the construction and maintenance of all the construction we've already finished. How are we governed? We have a charity here in Australia that my father helped to set up uh, many, many years ago. And then the schools in St. Jude in Tanzania are actually owned by a non-profit Tanzanian company. And this is the current board of that Tanzanian non-profit company. And again, the chairperson is a very strong woman. So it's great, uh, again, that the school, uh, the chairperson of our local board is actually a female. A lot of people ask me over the years, how do we select the kids and how do we work out who gets those 150 places? We live outside a town, or it's actually a city called Arusha, and it's actually 750,000 people. It is not a village. We can only support 150 new students every year because it is a, a, a free school, so we need to raise a lot of money. However, there are thousands of children who would qualify. I remember when I first got off the plane, I went, well, I want to help poor kids, and then I got off the plane and went, oh, Crikey, everybody's poor here. So how am I going to choose the children who get into the program? On the other side of the coin, we have sponsors and donors who are working very, very hard um, to sacrifice money to send across to the school for the kids' school fees and for the development of the school. So we have a duty to our sponsors and donors to use that money wisely. So like most scholarship programs around the world, we look in the background of the children. They have to be very, very poor, but we also look at the academic side of the child. You know, and are they driven? Are they excited about being, having an education? So how do we actually do it? We have a number of signs around our city, and for about six months of the year, we hang signs up that says the school is full. And uh, after about six months, we take the sign down and we hang up another sign that says the school has vacancies, please come to the school any Saturday morning. So from that Saturday to for about six months, we have lots of children coming to the school gates every single week, all wanting to compete for one of those 150 places. Sadly, we can't take everybody. So the first, what, what we do every single week is our gardeners and our guards bring all students into or applicants into the, into the schoolyard. They are then organised into lines and then we are, then our gardeners, they're the ones in the brown shirts, they're just quietly work, walking along the lines removing children who are obviously older than the grade one maximum age limit. After that, the, the children are then fed onto staff and we're looking for children who know how to read basic Kiswahili. Kiswahili is the language in our area and um, you know it's in The Lion King, it's in a lot of African films. But the school St Jude is known as an English medium school, which means that we teach everything in English. Why do we do that? Well, we want our kids to be as employable as possible. 
If you want to go to university in East Africa, you have to know English. If you want to be a safari guide or take somebody up Mount Kilimanjaro, you have to be able to speak English. Tourism, you know, all the hotels, you have to be able to speak English. If you want to work for an international aid organisation in East Africa, you need English. But sadly, in Tanzania, our primary schools don't have um, English-speaking teachers, and so it's normally the poor who don't get access to a good English education. However, because the children coming into the school are very poor, we don't expect them to have English. So at this stage, we're just looking for children who know their basic sounds of Kiswahili, their alphabet. We're lucky because Kiswahili is the same alphabet as English. So if the kids know their basic sounds of the alphabet and some basic blends like mama, baba, that sort of thing, they move on to the next level. Then there's a little bit of an academic test. It's about a 20-minute test, and obviously we've got to change this test every week because it's hot property outside the gate. <laughs> And then if they pass the test to a satisfactory standard the next day, they have to bring in documents to prove their background and who they are. Maybe they actually pass the test the day before because they're actually coming from a private school. You're not allowed to apply to St. Jude's if you are currently enrolled in a private school. Or maybe they pass the day before because they're actually 14 years old and they're just short, so the gardeners didn't you know, pick them out. So this is where we work out the background of the children. Over the, over the next few months, there are a series of poverty checks. We go to their homes about two or three times to make sure that the child is poor enough for our criteria. And then they also come into the school for a few weeks so that our own teachers can look at each child individually and make it, basically make the call whether this child should be given a scholarship or not. Finally, by December, the first week of December, we've settled on the 150 new students who, thanks to sponsors and donors around the world, will get a, got a scholarship for primary, secondary, and then also support at tertiary level. They come in the first week of December, and it's always very emotional because they get run out to their families, you know, because it culminates months and months of hard work, of fundraising and accounting and marketing and construction, employing, you know, sewing of new, you know, new uniforms, just so another 150 students can wear the St. Jude's uniform. But it's not just the kids who benefit. You can imagine all the men and women who are outside the school gates growing all the tons and tons of rice and maize and beans, tomatoes, onions, potatoes and vegetables that go into our over one million meals that we cook every year. Um, all the students and staff get a hot meal at lunch and if you are in boarding, you get breakfast and dinner as well. So what's next? Well, it's very exciting because the children that we started the school with have just started year 12. So the next stage is they're all thinking about what they're wanting to do in their future careers. However, by the time our children finish year 12, our kids would have had 13 years of a private education free of charge, which is a huge gift. Meanwhile, there are lots and lots of students outside the gates who weren't so lucky to get a scholarship. Now, I know our children are very, very poor, but I still believe that they need to have that gift of giving. And it is a gift to be able to give. And so after our students are in year 12, they will have to do a year of community service before we support them to go to tertiary. And why is that important? Well, I think community service is really important. I think it's good for the soul, it's good for the spirit. And the people who do community service usually get a lot more out of it than the people who are receiving it. In our area of Tanzania, we have about 3,500 government secondary and primary schools, but sadly there are huge teacher shortages. In northern Tanzania, we have 47,000 teachers in shortage. You know, the government secondary school in my village, she has over 1,000 students and she works really hard, the headmistress there. You know, but she needs, you know, she hasn't had a maths teacher for a number of years and she needs like four of them. On the other side of the coin, two-thirds of our year 11 and 12 students are doing really well in maths and science. Uh, you know, our students, our eldest ones, haven't done their year 12 exams yet, but they did do their year 10 exams a couple of years ago, and I'm proud to say that the school St. Jude got number one out of all the secondary schools in northern Tanzania. So the kids are doing very well and performing well, you know, in appreciation for their scholarships, but it is because of all the resources that have been poured into them. So for a year after our students finish year 12, they will be working as teachers in government schools in our district and in our region, helping the government students um, to maybe get past their national exams. In Tanzania, students have to sit national exams in primary school in grade four, 
in grade seven, form two, form four, and form six. And you have to pass those national exams to keep going on school. So I'm hoping that our students will help a lot of the kids outside the gate get through those nasty national exams so that the kids can go on to secondary school, whereas previously they may have only been able to stay, you know, finish at primary school. So that's what they'll be doing. They'll also be working in St. Jude's also as visitor, you know, visitor leaders and working as assistant teachers, marketing sponsorship teams, working on the IT team. A year of give back. So we've got Evelyn who is in year 12 and she comes from a Maasai background. You know, you know, historically the Maasai fathers don't believe in educating their daughters, but Evelyn enrolled in St. Jude's basically because it's free of charge, so didn't, Dad didn't have to <laughs> get any money out of his pocket. But Evelyn's in year 12 and she's wanting to be a doctor. And as a woman who's had my own four kids in, Uga in Tanzania, I can tell you that we definitely need doctors. So she's in year 12 at the moment, and this was her, a picture from her year 10 graduation. Meanwhile, at the other end of the scale, 150 new students just joined the school a couple of weeks ago, and 150 new ones will join again next year. So at the other end of the scale, we've got Ines, who is just embarking on her new world of getting a good education through the school St. Jude for kindergarten all the way through to university. So this is Ines, who's just enrolled in kindy. This is our, our website and um, you can easily find it. And I just wanted to say thanks to you and each of you, I've given you a DVD in your, you know, your show bags and um, that's a, a documentaries and you can watch the school in action on your TV and computer at home. But thank you very much. Thank you.